Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Oh, yeah? How many ECW championships have you won then? Oh, I know what. Uh, three times. Ha! Wrong. Man, ECW them ECW silhouette boys is weird. Don't worry, Haas, we're confused too. Make sense of your data protection with Surfshark VPN. Surfshark encrypts your personal data so nobody can track or steal it. Your online experience is safe and secure no matter where you are or what device you're on. Get past pesky geo restrictions and surf from anywhere in the world with the help of thousands of servers. With Surfshark, you're in control. Unlock these and dozens of other benefits by downloading Surfshark with the link in the description. For a limited time only, now you can save 85% off plus three extra months for free if you use the promo code REGRET. Thanks and enjoy this week's video. Is there a match type in wrestling more well known, more enduringly popular than the steel cage? I want Brody and I want him in a cage! The first recorded instance of a cage match in wrestling took place in Atlanta, Georgia on June 25th, 1937. And ever since then, we've seen tons of different variants on the genre. Once in a while, someone tries to think beyond the standard four walls of steel and get really creative in the hopes that theirs becomes one of the all-time great ideas in wrestling. Some of those wild new concepts on the steel structure have worked, while some have failed. But no matter the size or the shape of the cage, no matter the decade, the desire to watch guys beat the hell out of each other like animals is damn near universal. Of all the different structures out there though, there's only one that really matters. The one that's inspired every cage-based match since its inception. Of course, I'm talking about the shark cage match with Chief J Strongbow and Don Kent. The cage is very small as you can see, barely holding the two men. Kidding, kidding. This is what I really meant. Blood and guts! Ooh, close. Really close, Regal, though I was thinking of something else you said a while ago. War Games! There it is. This Saturday night at Survivor Series, the War Games match makes its long-awaited main roster debut in WWE. Make no mistake, this is a huge deal. In the previous regime, WWE was always hesitant to utilize WCW ideas. And when it comes to match types, there's none other from that company with a greater legacy than that of War Games. Many people see this as the ultimate validation of the match's creator, a massive seal of approval for perhaps his greatest contribution to the world of sports entertainment from the biggest name in that world. The fact that War Games is coming to Survivor Series is a brilliant piece of business for a few reasons. For one, the show historically has been the place where newness is the name of the game. Think of all the stars who made their debut at this event over the years. The Undertaker, The Rock, Kurt Angle, John Moxley, Seth Rollins, Roman Reigns, current and future legends all. The Elimination Chamber made its debut at Survivor Series 2002, a match that was actually the result of a compromise between Vince McMahon and Triple H, the man who's been spearheading the War Games campaign for longer than some of today's fans have been alive. Just the Survivor Series match concept alone was considered highly experimental in 1987, though even that was lightly inspired by the multi-man aspect of war games. Oh yeah, and the entire pay-per-view exists because they wanted to run against Starcade the same day. As I talked about in my review of the inaugural Survivor Series, that show crushed Starcade 87 in pay-per-view buys, mostly because of the power WWE wielded over the cable companies. So for a product of Jim Crockett Promotions to get the red carpet treatment at one of WWE's most significant shows of the year, it's undoubtedly a full circle moment. But WWE is hardly the only company who's tried to capture the magic of the match beyond. Ever since WCW went under, everyone from Ring of Honor to MLW to AEW have all done their take on war games. Its influence has stood the test of time as it's finally made its way back onto a major show. As we prepare for its epic return this weekend, let's take a brief look at the history of war games and try and figure out why its spirit has persisted all these years. In 1986, Jim Crockett Promotions was in the midst of its hottest year, both financially and creatively. But things took an unfortunate turn that October when the heir apparent to Dusty Rhodes' spot as a top babyface in Magnum TA suffered a career-ending car accident. Between that, a poorly planned purchase of Bill Watts' UWF and some bad accounting, JCP suddenly found itself in dire straits and needed to hit a few creative dingers to stay above water. Luckily for them, they had Dusty Rhodes as their booker. 
You can never claim that the American dream was ever not creative enough. Over the decades, the man came up with more event and match concepts than you can shake a cowbell at. In an effort to generate excitement for the 1987 Great American Bash Tour, Dusty needed something huge, and what was bigger and more American than war itself. Inspired by the film Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Dusty created the War Games match by smushing together two other match types, the Cage Match and the Two Ring Battle Royal. It's been said that 1983's Last Battle of Atlanta, a bloody war between Buzz Sawyer and Tommy Rich, was the inspiration for Hell in a Cell. But it could also be argued that it played a role in War Games first, which, coincidentally enough, also debuted in the City of Trees. It was at the Omni in Atlanta on the 4th of July, 1987, the four horsemen and J.J. Dillon fought in a losing effort to Dusty Rhodes, the newly turned Nikita Koloff, the Road Warriors, and their manager, Paul Ellering. The match was a total bloodbath that resulted in some real-life injuries to some of the competitors, but thanks to its relatively simple rules and guaranteed violence, it was a critical and financial success that helped elevate the entire Bash tour. War Games helped wrap up the tour in Miami at the end of the month, then was brought out again on house shows in Chicago and Long Island, New York. That last one was the first to not utilize all the horsemen, but in each of those first four War Games matches in 87, the babyface team won in the end. With the massive success of War Games, JCP had a signature match for the ages. The match initially served as a showcase for the devious four horsemen, but their losses to those Dusty Rhodes led teams is what helped establish War Games as the ultimate be all end all match type. Then Starcade 87 happened, drawing only a fraction of the number of buys the WWF earned with Survivor Series that same night. Any goodwill and positive cash flow that Crockett Promotions had gained that summer was quickly dashed by the financial failure of their biggest show of the year. 1988 was a year of desperate Hail Mary attempts by the Dream in order to reverse the company's dwindling fortunes. While the War Games match was used sparingly in 87, the same could not be said the following year. That summer tour of house shows saw a whopping 11 War Games in the span of about a month and a half, and though none were ever televised or commercially released at the time, its flagrant overuse helped wear out the concept in the eyes of many fans. But that paled in comparison to what happened at the 1988 Great American Bash, the first ever televised televised version of War Games was barely War Games at all. Instead, it was given some new, whack-ass twist with the Tower of Doom, a three-tiered cage match in a single ring that involved trap doors, lots of awkward brawling, and an escape rule to win. The fans in Baltimore were surprisingly into it, but the match beyond, it was not. Jim Ross, how would you describe this? A cluster fuck. JCP was purchased by Ted Turner a few months later to become World Championship Wrestling, and Dusty was soon out as Booker after he defied the corporate rules about bloodletting. But in 1989, new Booker Ric Flair continued to utilize war games, first at that year's Bash pay-per-view, and again at a house show in Atlanta. Much in the same vein as in 88, the match was more of a mid-card display than something befitting the main event. Thus, it was time to give war games a break, as the match went dormant throughout all of 1990. But by 91, Flair was was out and Dusty Rhodes was back in as the head man in charge, and that meant the return of War Games at that year's Wrestle War. The match came back with a vengeance, not only main eventing a pay-per-view for the first time in its history, but also going down as the first one where the heel team won. This one, which saw the Horsemen defeat Sting, the Steiners, and Flying Brian Pillman, earned the coveted five-star rating from Dave Meltzer, despite that horrific-looking moment when Sid crushed Pillman on both ends with a powerbomb into the cage roof. You may mock Sid for that, but hey, the man main evented every WrestleMania he ever appeared on. After another string of house show appearances to close out the summer of 91, War Games spent the next six years exclusively on pay-per-view, finally cementing its status as a top-tier spectacle. First, there was the classic bout at Wrestle War 92, where Sting's squadron bested the Dangerous Alliance in another five-star bloodbath that saw the beginning of the end of Paul Lee's supergroup. By 93, Eric Bischoff replaced Cowboy Bill Watts as WCW's EVP and began making sweeping changes for the overall betterment of the company. One one such move was making the War Games match a cornerstone of the annual Fall Brawl pay-per-view. However, Shut <laughs> I told you. It's easy to forget in the midst of all the hilarity, but yes, the Shockmaster's awesomely bad debut was meant to hype his appearance as the partner of Sting, Davy Boy Smith, and Dustin Rhodes to face Sid, Vader, and Harlem Heat in the match beyond. It should have worked! It should have worked! And if you thought that no match could live up to such an auspicious debut, 
You'd be right, as the 93 edition is considered to be one of the most forgettable in War Games history. Rather than accept defeat and embrace fate with the Shockmaster's terrible first impression, they doubled down on him as a somewhat clumsy monster, with Uncle Fred entering last and immediately winning the match of the bear hug, as if the whole gimmick wasn't quite 83 enough for everyone already. Things improved slightly with the 94 iteration, when Dusty, Dustin, and the Nasty Boys beat the stud stable, but then things really took a dive in 95, at the height of Hulkamania's insufferable grip on WCW, when Hulk Hogan, Sting, Randy Savage, and Lex Luger beat the half hapless Dungeon of Doom. Once considered to be a feud ender, the match ended up being the appetizer to the main course of Hulk Hogan and the Giant at Halloween Havoc 95. Mmm mmm, and what a meal it was! While not used as a blow-off, War Games spent the next several years as a catalyst for major points in the NWO angle, with wins in both 96 and 97 against Team WCW. The 96 edition was known for the debut of NWO Sting, which eventually prompted the real Sting to show up, prove it could beat all those assholes at once, then zip back up to the rafters for another year. 1997 saw Kurt Hennig shockingly betray Ric Flair and the Horsemen because, hey, why settle for 12 members in a group when you could be lucky number 13? But but the 1998 edition was perhaps the greatest departure from the original formula since the 88 Great American Bash. Not only did this match have three teams of three as opposed to two teams of four or five, but for the first time ever, pinfalls were allowed. Ultimately, it took the New World Order to fragment into two groups, Hollywood and Wolfpack, for WCW to finally get a win at the big event. But that year's true legacy was WCW's half-hearted attempt to showcase the Ultimate Warrior and his Undertaker-like powers. This included the use of a trap door the ring, a fun feature that many of the wrestlers apparently didn't know about beforehand, which resulted in Davy Boy Smith suffering a severe back injury that hampered his career and some would say shortened his lifespan. War Games! After that mess, War Games needed a rest, and the match went dark for another two years before Vince Russo would bring it out of the mothballs. Hang on a second. Oh, damn it, Vince, you opened the wrong box. This one says 88, not 98. The September 4th, 2000 edition of Monday Nitro saw the spectacle known as War Games 2000 Russo's Revenge. Aside from having an excessive two subtitles to its name, this match only added fuel to the conspiracy that Russo was actually a double agent sent by Vincent Mann to hasten WCW's downfall. Part War Games, part Tower of Doom, and part Capture the Flag, the match saw outside brawling, handcuffs, Vince Russo as an active competitor, additional run-ins, and swerves atop of swerves, ending with Kevin Nash retaining his world title. Oh yeah, did I mention that this was a title match that anybody could have won, even people on Nash's own team? WCW finally went under just six months later in March of 2001, and with it, the War Games match. The 2000 edition was a sad end to a match steeped in history, one that bridged the gap between generations of wrestlers, though one that had lost some of its emotional oomph in its final years. WWE owned the rights to the name upon purchasing WCW, and despite fans demanding its return for Forever, it was kept under lock and key for a very long time. That being said, WWE did not own the concept of people fighting in one to two rings surrounded by a cage with each person coming in at timed increments. That shit's in the public domain. Though variations on the War Games match were seen in the 1990s in places like Smoky Mountain Wrestling, ECW, and in Memphis, the death of WCW saw even more companies scramble to stake their claim to the match. XPW held their own version called Genocide in 2002. Impact Wrestling had Wednesday Bloody Wednesday in 2003. Ring of Honor held several steel cage warfare matches between 2005 and 2013. MLW did it in 2003 and again in 2018. Pro Wrestling Eve and Women's Super Stars Uncensored were the first to have ladies fight in a war game style. And of course, All Elite Wrestling continued its quest to become the spiritual successor to WCW by introducing Blood and Guts in 2021. They say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, and judging by all the attempts made to recreate war games over the years, it's obvious that the impact that it made on wrestlers and fans alike was a massive one. Even though WWE didn't want to give it away themselves, the demand was clearly there, which speaks volumes to its value. As I mentioned earlier, the match was rumored to return as early as the 2002 Survivor Series, but eventually became the Elimination Chamber, which borrowed a lot of the same elements. War Games was practically a dirty word in WWE for years, until in 2013, when the company released a DVD anthology of the match type hosted by Dusty Rhodes himself. 
Over the last 20 years, WWE's home video releases did wonders to revitalize dead brands and keep the spirit of others alive. Look no further than ECW, WCW, Saturday Night's Main Event, Hulk Hogan, and Ric Flair. Whether or not the War Games DVD was meant to be a litmus test for a revival is unclear, but fans finally got the answer to their prayers in 2017 when the match finally came back for NXT. It made sense considering not only was the black and yellow brand Triple H's pet project at the time, but also also, there was a lower risk because NXT was the developmental brand, unless it was competing against Raw or SmackDown and nothing else. Even though it was one level below the main roster, the fact that War Games had come back at all in WWE was nothing short of a minor miracle. Much like how the original War Games was meant to showcase the Horsemen, this new version did the same for the Undisputed Era, who were in the first four matches of its type in NXT. And in 2019, the women got in on the action. Although some things have changed from the original formula, like the removal of the the cage roof to accommodate big high spots, there's no denying that the success of War Games on NXT played a gigantic role in its promotion to the main roster at this year's Survivor Series. So why has the match beyond stayed in the hearts and minds of fans for so long? Well, like I said earlier, fans love a good cage match, but there's more to it than that. Way back in 87, Dusty Rhodes added just enough of a twist and just enough spice to the standard classic to create a whole new universe of action, unlimited combinations and potential outcomes, non-stop drama and suspense. And no matter what happens this Saturday when it gets the grand treatment on pay-per-view, it's hard to imagine that it won't be met with wild enthusiasm and nostalgia when that cage begins to lower. This Saturday is the culmination of a long and winding road that began in the birthplace of the steel cage match with lots of trial and error along the way to become the ultimate multi-person confrontation in pro wrestling. And like many of you, I can't wait for it. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. What's your favorite War Games match over the years? I want to hear about it in the comments section below. Of course, I got to give love to WrestleWar 92, Sting Squadron versus the Dangerous Alliance, a timeless classic. But of the more modern matches, I got to say I really enjoyed in 2019, Team Champa versus the Undisputed Era, which involved Kevin Owens being Champa's mystery partner and showing up on NXT in rare form. That was good stuff as well. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and click the bell if you haven't, folks. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time time.